Hi, I'm Michelle Segrist, and welcome to the Factory of the Future podcast. This podcast is inspired by my three-volume book series on the evolution of modern manufacturing. Each episode features engaging conversations with game-changing experts discussing the processes and innovations that are changing the landscape of modern manufacturing. Thank you so much for listening. Please do me a favor and leave me a five-star rating on iTunes and take just a couple of seconds to leave a review. And then go ahead and hit that subscribe button right now so you don't miss a single episode. Today, I'm really happy to welcome Andrew Johnson, founder and CEO of Shelf Aware. Get ready for a really cool conversation. This is going to be a fun one. Andrew Johnson is an entrepreneur, inventor, and business owner. Formerly the sales manager at the family distribution company, O-Ring Sales and Service, he is now pursuing a new endeavor, a tech startup called ShelfAware, which is attempting to redefine industrial supply chains by leveraging RFID technology, the internet, and the power of data. He is also lucky to work with his three equally talented and passionate brothers. I'm really excited to talk with Andrew today. Many of you may be familiar with the best-selling book by Michael Lewis called Moneyball, The Art of Winning an Unfair Game. This is one of my favorite books. It was also made into an Oscar-nominated movie starring Brad Pitt. It's the story of how a Major League Baseball team found a way to win with the smallest budget in the Major Leagues. Oakland A's general manager, Billy Bean, puts together a baseball team on a budget by employing computer-generated analytics and analysis to draft his players, focusing on many small wins over a few huge impacts. Today, we're going to talk about how this money ball approach can be applied to the future of manufacturing. This is really going to be fascinating, so let's get to it. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun and exciting. Absolutely. I've been really looking forward to this. And I want to jump right in. I know you have a very interesting story to tell. So I want to give you a few minutes just to talk about your background and how you got involved in manufacturing and just Mm -hmm. give us a little history about who you are and what you do and why you would be an expert in manufacturing. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll try and keep it brief too. A lot of people ask me how long I've I've been doing this, and I'm I'm not old. I'm a young man, so I'm 35, and I tell them I've been doing it for 35 years, and they kind of laugh at that. But in all <laughs> seriousness, it's the real thing. I grew up in the family business that my dad started before I was born, which is an industrial distributor who predominantly sells to original equipment manufacturers. So that's their primary customer base. Mm-hmm. So I I grew up in this world of product design and engineering and distribution of product to manufacturers and a whole host of different product verticals from heavy industry pumps and motors to hydraulics and pneumatics and automotive and marine applications and firearm applications. And it was a fascinating upbringing. I worked in the business from an early age. My father was a big believer in child labor, forced Uh child labor. (laughs) Yeah. And it uh, helped us cover, you know, the bottom line for the family. So it was important. I grew up, decided through a series of odd circumstances that I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I like it. It's interesting. It's always new. It's always fascinating. There's always new ground to take. And so I jumped into the family business with my dad uh, right out of college in 2009. And then in really odd set of circumstances, found myself working with my three brother-in-laws. So I have three sisters, no brothers, but all my sisters married very entrepreneurial men. And they, through different circumstances, wound up working at our family business, O-Ring Sales and Service. And I mean, it took us a couple of years to kind of figure everybody out and figure out where we fit and what we're going to do. But by 2012, 2013, we had all started working collectively on the business instead of in the business. And that was really pushed on us because we had to adopt a new ERP system. So we had this daunting system adoption that we had to undertake. And we just jumped in with both feet, all of us, all the brothers, and started working on this adoption. We did our own data refinement and data transition. We took care of all of our own data migration to the new system. And that whole process that we were forced into forced us to look at our business entirely different and launched us into this whole journey that we're going to talk about called Moneyball Innovation, where unknowingly, 
We were setting off on an innovative journey to invent things, to make better processes, to destroy a lot of stuff in the process of innovation, to try and optimize. And it was not something we'd necessarily sit down and plan to do. I mean, we sat down and said, hey, we're going to grow our family business. And we're going to grow it efficiently. But we didn't necessarily know how we were going to do it. And we just stumbled into this process of Moneyball innovation. So that brought me to where I'm at today, which is through a series of inventions and process improvements. We invented some new devices. We invented some new systems that we used internally and then eventually invented a system that we used as a distributor to monitor, remotely monitor and resupply our our manufacturing customers with inventory. We launched that system in 2017 to the whole market. We launched it quietly, just kind of selfishly in our own business for three years and then kind of grew so fast. We said, hey, we can spin this into a service that's agnostic that we can license to other industrial distributors. And so that grew into what I'm managing today. It's a company called Shelf Aware. Uh, Shelf Aware leverage is RFID tags that are embedded inside product packaging. And we use this smart packaging to monitor consumption of industrial inventory on consumer shelves on a factory floor setting. So it turns the factory inventory area into basically a smart grocery store. Factory employees can grab what they need when they need it and walk away. And the hardware we have deployed at the factory monitors the movement of that inventory and then reports back to the supplier that, hey, they use the product, you need to send them more. That's about the shortest version of my whole life story I could tell you and what leads us to this conversation today. I think that's really cool. And I did read a little bit about the Shelf Aware technology. And if I understand it correctly, it's kind of like a virtual vending machine. They're monitored and replenished remotely. So Mm -hmm. especially in the times that we're in right now, in the times of COVID and other things, this is kind of good timing for a product like this, right? Or a service? Uh, Is it a service? Is it a product? It's a little bit of both. It's a service, I guess, in the heart of it, but it's perfect timing. A lot of innovation is about timing and a lot of timing is just about luck. And so in in that mindset, we did get kind of lucky. Nobody says you're going to be lucky that COVID came, but COVID did uh, highlight some innovations in the marketplace and the need to go more remote and to leverage data and to leverage the internet of things, which is a concept of turning your ordinary objects into internet connected objects. And so that's what we did with packaging, making it smart with an RFID tag that interacts with a reader, puts that packaging online. So now we can see when the package is consumed, where it's at, how it got consumed, when it got consumed. And it really does turn manufacturers shelves so they don't have to buy any fancy equipment that just turns their standard old dusty pallet racks or shelving or floor stock into virtual vending machines. They're smart packages that kind of live and breathe and you can interact with those packages and walk away. And that's the system that we launched. Then COVID came and said, hey, we really don't want people from a supplier's location. So supplier staff to have to come on site and visually reload inventory, which is very common in the manufacturing space with vendor managed inventory programs. You'll have a supplier contractor enter your facility two or three times a week, maybe every day to monitor inventory consumption and resupply your folks with the inventory they need to complete their manufacturing process or even in the maintenance and repair market. When with Shelf Aware, you don't have to do that. So the supplier can actually view your inventory on hand over the internet from afar, never enter your facility. And we actually just resupply by leveraging the fantastic UPS, FedEx uh, services that have been made very, very fast and very, very cheap because Amazon made them better, faster, cheaper over the last decade. So we just leveraged that. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. And what you said about COVID, I mean, obviously we can't use the word lucky, but I do think that a lot of my other guests have mentioned this too, that COVID forced us to embrace Mm -hmm. technology, even those that were not quite ready for it. A lot of companies just were afraid of it or not ready to automate. And COVID has kind of brought that to light. Those companies that were automated and had automated systems We're better prepared for something like COVID than others, wouldn't you say? I definitely, 100%. Humans, we're always going to be resistant to change, and you'll never see more dramatic change except in times of distress. That is the most dramatic and fastest paced change adoption you will see is when we're all pressured to do it. We really have no choice. We have to, you know, change or die. And that might be a little dramatic, but with COVID, that was reality. Like we're faced with that really stark decision. You got to move and you got to change and you got to move fast. As an inventor and entrepreneur, I love change. That was one of the silver linings for this complete disaster was it turned certain markets on its head. It made some big targets of mine completely receptive to the conversation where initially they were, "Uh, you know, we have systems that we've had in place a long time and people that we like and they just kind of work and I don't know that we're really wanting to change. And then all of a sudden COVID came and hey, they're picking up the phone calling me. Hey, we got to figure this out now. That's a good thing. And it helps us to think more into the future. 
you have to be prepared for things like this sometimes. Before we move into the meat of our conversation, I just wanted to go back a minute to your history. You talked about being born into the industrial marketplace and Mm -hmm. and being cheap child slave labor for your family. I I I grew up in a family business too, not in manufacturing, but we, we all went to work and that was part of it. And I love what you said about that. And I'm just curious. Okay, so you're 35 years old and you've Mm -hmm. seen manufacturing since birth. And I'm just curious because I'm very interested in the history of manufacturing. I'm wondering, first of all, what's the first impression? What's the first memory you have of being around manufacturing of any kind? And also, if you can tell me, what are some of the biggest innovations you've seen? What, How has it changed in the past 30 some odd years that you've been exposed to it? Yeah, great question. My first memory that that was really impactful for me was my dad pulled me out of school when I was, I think I was about 12 years old, maybe or 13, because he had a great opportunity to travel up and down the West Coast and visit a few suppliers and customers. He threw me out on the road with a few of his sales guys, and we visited a couple factories that both supplied us product and then customers that we supplied product to. And I remember just being fascinated by the heavy machinery, the loud noises. We were visiting rubber production facilities for a lot of our supply base, and They were really dirty and smelly and hot and stinky. But at the end of the day, I I just thought it was a really cool playground where you could make stuff, get stuff done. And I like the people there. I like the blue collar type of folks who like to work hard and get their hands dirty. It's always resonated with me. And I also love the industry we're in. So selling O-rings and seals and gaskets puts you in such a variety of manufacturing facilities because everybody has seals. It seems like they're just buried in every device. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah. And I know you got experience with pumps, lots of pump Mm -hmm. manufacturing. They're riddled with seals and you got pumps for like every application, pumping all sorts of stuff. So you never know where it's going to take you. And so So that's That's right. Yeah, that's what I love about it. It's always changing from my perspective of who I get to see and what markets I'm in. And I'll go from like the dirtiest facility that's like wastewater treatment. And then the next visit is to a a really pristinely clean food manufacturing facility. That's right. They're very um, different, right? Yeah. There's something to be learned from every single one of them. I've been in almost 100 manufacturing facilities all over the world and written about almost all of them. And there's always something different. Mm -hmm. Even if you go into two pharmaceutical manufacturers or two food manufacturers or two car manufacturers, they do things, uh, some the same and Mm -hmm. some just a little bit different. So there's always something to be learned. And anybody who's interested and how things are made should absolutely go into one of these facilities. Like you said, yes. there's so many bright and shiny objects to, yes. to look oh, yeah. at, Definitely. things to, to, in, to spark all your senses. There's smells and there's sounds and there's things to look at. It really is stimulating mm-hmm. and, and exciting more so than people might think. Exactly. exactly. But as far as watching or witnessing change from, from my entire 30 years, I would have to say, and I have a, a global perspective as well, so I've traveled to Southeast Asia a lot over the, mm-hmm. the last decade and been to a lot of factories in Southeast Asia and India. Unfortunately, the U.S. marketplace has not changed or adopted change and innovation nearly as fast as I would like them to. And I always have put that in perspective, juxtaposed with the, the Asian marketplace. And again, I think it comes back to necessity. So American manufacturing scene, so much of it was outsourced and so much of a de-emphasis put on making things in America, unfortunately, for, for my whole existence. It's been mainly a story of outsourcing uh, with the advent of Walmart, basically, and everything made in China and China really rising to the challenge in the last 20, 30 years. So I've actually witnessed a sad period in American manufacturing where they ceased to dump money in it. So you saw a lack of investment, a lack of innovation, a lack of adoption of new systems and technology. And you saw American manufacturers kind of have to just make do with what they've had for a long, long time. And it's rendered our landscape in America antiquated behind the times, especially when it compares with ecosystems like you see in Japan, Taiwan, uh, and China, where they have increasing labor constraints in those markets and and constraints that, frankly, we're going to see in the next 10 years here in America, or we're seeing right now, actually, with with nobody able to find the workers that they really need with the skill sets that they really need. And you've seen those in Asia and Japan, especially in Taiwan, those small island countries for years. And so they've actually taken a lot of really drastic measures and steps to create very automated, innovative, data-driven, robotics-enabled facilities that leave us in a position in America to catch up. 
we have a lot of work to do in a short time. The good news is the ecosystem, the tech ecosystem in America is the best in the world. We have the infrastructure with the advent of 5G, with the advent of the cloud, the advent of mobile apps, and all of our citizens having smartphones. We have the opportunity to adopt and create uh, new systems, automated systems, data-driven systems, remote systems, and do it really quickly. So we got a lot of ground to make up, but I think we can do it really quickly. I agree with you completely on that assessment. We really have a lot of catching up to do. And I think we're on the way as American manufacturers, but we also have good models. You know, there are things we can model from European manufacturing and from manufacturing that's happening in India, from, as you said, the manufacturing that's happening in Asia. You don't have to always reinvent the wheel. You can look and see what other nations are doing to improve Mm -hmm. their manufacturing and model that. But we also can be innovative and come up with interesting solutions on our own. So uh, American manufacturing has the opportunity to catch up and maybe on the way to doing that, hopefully. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer with my 30 years of a perspective <laughs> here. Because I am, I'm obviously, as an innovator, I'm an optimist I, I, internally. I'm I have sure. to be. The future in American manufacturing is extremely exciting and has a lot of potential. Uh, and I think we're going through a huge change demographically in our country. You're seeing kind of the wind down of globalization. Uh, I think that's mm-hmm. going to continue politically and, and geographically across the whole globe. So it's coming. We need to kind of prepare for it. Hopefully we can make the right pivots as a country and a nation to take advantage of just the global change here and kind of reinvent or reinvigorate our manufacturing scenario. Let's dive into this money ball conversation. This is one of my favorite books. And of course, when the movie came out, Brad Pitt was, of course, good inspiration to go and watch it. So I did. But Mm -hmm. the concept is pretty interesting. Take us through the concept. I described it briefly in the opening, but kind of give us an idea of the concept and Mm -hmm. why that translates to manufacturing and how it translates to manufacturing. Right. So from my experience, I backed into this whole thing. So my brothers and I, we had really no clue that we were embarking on a money ball innovation journey or one of what they can also say is incremental innovation. So it's the idea of uh, a series of small wins will get you around the bases because a baseball analogy is perfect for this. It'll get you around the bases and eventually to home plate. And as an organization, small, medium or large, if you try and set some really, really lofty goals, which are great but you have no executable way to get there, you swing and miss a lot and you end up striking out and you're never going to hit that home run or it's a very low percentage that you will hit the home run. So what I encourage people to do, and this is based off of our own internal success, is to adopt an incremental approach. So you go ahead and set your lofty goal and that's important and you put your vision out there. Okay. And for us in the family business, we had a really simple vision. I mean, it was a big vision and we're still on our way to try and get there. But as a small distributor, we set out a goal of, we called it the 15, 15, 15 plan. So that was, we were going to try and do 15 million in revenue in product sales inside of 15,000 square feet with 15 people. Oh, wow. So that was our metrics. We're going to get there. So we set our big goal and then we said, okay, how are we going to get there? Well, if you set this big goal, what the goal was, was really a set of three constraints. And so we can only work with 15 people total. We want to keep it in 15,000 square feet, which for a distributor of physical goods means you have to limit your on-hand inventory that you can leverage to do that because inventory takes up space and shelving. And then we're going to do it with the kind of the goal was to push 15 million in revenue. We started the process by establishing our home plate, our big goal, and then we run in the bases by looking for small bite-sized innovations that don't cost a lot of money. And we had to set aside a team. Of course, in my family business, the team was my brothers. So my brothers and I, we had to first work on getting ourselves out of the daily. So we had a little bit of uh, time in our day to set aside to this idea of attaining some new ground of innovating. And so we we set aside some of our daily duties and tackled this as a team. So we had created an innovation team. Then we set up some small innovation goals. They were all internal. So this was an innovation that wasn't going to leave our four walls. It wasn't going to impact our customers or our suppliers. These were just innovations that were going to happen inside our business. And I think that's important to denote. You don't want to have an an incremental innovation that is too complex, meaning it touches other businesses. And so just keep it internal to start with. And we looked for our first innovations in bottlenecks and time constraints and in processes in our business that were slow, that were cumbersome, that were fraught with errors. And we started to innovate them, uh, optimize 
recognize them. And oftentimes it would be a complete deconstruction. We'd obliterate what we currently had and then put something brand new in place. That was our Moneyball approach. If you haven't watched the movie, like you said, I encourage everybody to watch it with, it's a good movie anyway, uh, with Brad Pitt. But that baseball analogy is, is a wonderful analogy and frame of mind to enter into a manufacturing or business landscape in general and tackle uh, innovation theory and get it from theory to the practical. It's a phenomenal example of how you do it. It really is interesting when you break it down and you think about, okay, how do you win ball games? You win ball games by scoring runs, but they don't have to be home runs, right? Mm -mm. The more you get on base, the more the odds are that you're going to score runs. A run that's walked in is just, just as valuable, as, just yeah. as much as mm -hmm. a home run that's hit over the fence. So the idea is to play a little small ball and mm -hmm. get your runners mm -hmm. around the bases. And you're more likely to have more people who can get on base than you are likely to have home run hitters. Yep. Yeah. And also exactly. the, home, the home run hitters are typically more expensive too. They, they are. They, they are. They want more money. And so it's finding, as you said, I love, I just think you perfectly explained the scenario in manufacturing terms. You're looking for inexpensive wins, whether it be with technology, with a guest on the podcast who have said, you know, you put one sensor on one pump in a manufacturing facility and you have automated. Uh -huh. That's yeah. a win. You don't have to have 10 sensors on every single pump in the whole facility to automate. Yeah. Of course, that may be your long-term goal. I've been in plants that had 15,000 pumps. Right. So you, know, you start with ones, then two, then three, then maybe mm -hmm. make a goal of getting them on 100 and work it. That's work right. It and there's a couple things that I think if you're going to take the money ball approach to innovation, which I honestly am a huge believer in, it's the only way to do it. You need to set the stage. You need to kind of assemble your team. So I talked about our innovation team, but another good consideration is just the company culture in general. So if you're going to try and innovate, nobody wants to change. Organizations don't want to change. And so to get all the staff on board, small wins are where it's at. Because if you can get a couple small wins, it illustrates to the entire company that, hey, we're headed in a new direction that's wildly successful. I mean, look at what they've done here. They've made the break room better. That's they've right. made our uh, our environment in the front office paperless, which has been so nice. We don't have to waste time filing papers now. We can access uh, documents digitally on our phone or on our PC and instantly. Mm -hmm. So like you look for those small wins that are really attainable. I think a couple other characteristics that you need to also think about when you're about to start this journey or before you start the journey is the people on your staff and who you put on that innovation team. Honestly, if you're in manufacturing today and you don't employ a software programmer, either on a contract basis or a full-time basis, you're crazy. Most of our journey was software related. So our innovations all started in the database, trying to look at the data we had and, and leveraging it into an automated basis to drive analytics that would drive daily decisions or just straight up do transactions for us behind the scenes so we didn't have to have people pushing buttons or pushing paper initially. And so if you don't have a programmer on payroll, I'd get one or I'd get at least a contracted group on board because the environment we're in today, which I mentioned earlier, the cloud environment, the mobile app environment, it's ripe, ripe for sure. really cheap innovation. So you can make a mobile app for a couple grand. And our, our first mobile app that we developed was simply to get rid of a process that we had where we had to... So when we pulled parts in the O-ring environment, you cannot ship an O-ring that's the wrong material because if it's the right size, they're all black and round and it right. gets installed in a, a pump application, it's the wrong material. You're going to have serious consequences down the road, lots of failures, and they won't happen until they get in the field and they're getting used. So it's, it's a massive debacle of warranty claims of huge proportions. So as a distributor, that's kind of the cardinal sin is making a mistake in shipping and just pulling the wrong black and round O-ring. So when we started our innovation journey, we actually had a person in the warehouse that would have to double check every pick, every pull. And we said, man, this takes a lot of time. There's a person, as we grew, literally committed to checking everything we were pulling. So our first mobile app, we went to a kid in a junior college program in Kansas City and said, hey, can you develop this mobile app for us? And he did it in a weekend. And we gave him like 2,500 bucks. And he was over the <laughs> moon. I mean, he I'm thought sure. he was rich. You know, all the beer and pizza he could buy. It didn't take him more than a couple days. And I don't know, maybe he stayed up all night or something a couple nights. But he cranked out our first little mobile app and we deployed it on Android devices in our warehouse. It would allow us to scan two QR codes on our travelers and match them to the product. So we'd pull physical product, scan a QR code, and then pull, you know, scan a QR code that was also on our pick ticket. And if those two matched, then they'd pull the right part based on, on lot information that we were running in the in our ERP system. So that replaced 
the checker, the double checker, which was ended up as we grew being an entire person's full-time job, which again, we're not about eliminating people we're about eliminating just unnecessary labor so we can reposition it to places where it does take a human's touch to make the process uh, right. complete. But so, also when you replace those mundane tasks and you can reposition somebody in another task or another job, it helps them to grow as well. And they might get to do something that's much more exciting than what they were doing before. I like this idea. You're not eliminating people. You're increasing their skill set mm-hmm. and helping them to learn more and grow with the company. I like that a lot. And you also made another point I wanted to bring about this idea of having a programmer on staff. This makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons, I think. And correct me if I'm wrong. So if you're out there and you have a problem, like you said, you had a problem where it was too much labor to to do this task. So you see the problem within your facility, you have a programmer and you go to them and say, okay, I need a solution for this. And you don't have to find software that's already out there. Mm -mm. You can create your own software that fits with your facility. We already talked about how every facility is different. It fits with your problems that you want to solve. And that just makes perfect sense to have someone like that. And it also makes perfect sense to get somebody young. A millennial. They've they've grown up doing this stuff. I mean, people in my generation can't even hardly work their smartphone. And these guys are writing programs in a weekend. So it just makes perfect sense. And again, not to underplay it, but they don't require as much money. It goes back to this money ball scenario. They just want pizza and beer money. So if they can do that and give you a solution and then they're happy too, hey, look at this cool thing I created. And Mm -hmm. that helps them down the road as well. It's just win, 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 win. But it makes perfect sense that this is kind of this money ball scenario where it's small little wins. You solve that problem in a weekend. Yeah. Yeah. In a weekend. And um, yeah, it was a quick win. And that's what it's all about is tackling projects that you can knock out quickly because a lot of your projects you also have to have this mindset too as a company. They're going to be failures. You're going to create things that you think are a good idea and they're awful. So if you're going after giant wins, when it fails, you lose so much. And it's, it's not for me as an entrepreneur, I, I'm really not risk adverse. So I, I will do risky things. So I'm not really scared about losing money. Even at 35, I've realized that the most important thing to me is my time. So if, if I sink a ton of time into some really complex lofty project that's trying to just hit a home run and then we fail miserably, I'll never get that back. That time is gone. And it's really tough for an organization to get back on track after sinking so much time into something that fails. So start small. Look for that quick win and just repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And over time, your ideas will actually build on top of each other. So you're and keeping people on base so that when you have, on base, when yeah. have that big hit, those those guys come in and score. Right. But the other thing, and I, I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit, because to do the, the money ball approach and to take mobile apps and third-party software and, and not look for the giant win. So don't go to the big guys, the giant software firms that are making software, that have been making software for, for decades, ERP and MRP systems. They're all really, really good systems. They're great. And they do a lot, but they won't do exactly what you need to do in your market. They just won't. They can't make software that customizable, that specialized. What you need to do is you get your overarching ecosystem in place, you know, the the big lofty ERP. And then what we did was we backed into all these innovation projects that connected to our ERP system. And in order to do that, in order to write mobile apps that interact with your ERP system, you have to have an innovative team. You have to look for the small wins. You have to give them a big budget of time, not money. And then you have to have that programmer out there that's looking for those front end applications. But on the back end, this is the part that I think people forget about or get going too fast and, and never really have a great handle on. You have to have, as a business, as a manufacturer, you have to have an incredible handle on your data. And in our story, our little family business story, that happened when we didn't even really know it. But that ERP system we adopted, when we decided in 2012 to do the adoption ourselves, to not outsource the data migration, that forced my brothers and I to get so deep into our data as a company. We knew every data field that we were going to populate in our MRP ERP system intimately and how it interacted with other data tables and other data fields. That foundation, that intimate knowledge of our data, how it's stored, how we capture it, how we interact with it, was fundamental to our Moneyball success and approach. You can't go out and get a mobile app developed unless you have a strong handle of your internal data because the application designer is going to say, great, now I need to plug this into your system. Well, we don't know where it plugs into or how it plugs in. 
And once we plug it in, we don't necessarily know how it's going to interact with our other fields or other transactions or other processes. So, I mean, I got a bit ahead of myself because it was such a natural part of our journey that we didn't even know we were doing. But I think for a lot of other organizations, they're going to have to set apart, set aside some pre-planning months, maybe a year before they hop into this really fast-paced incremental money ball approach and get themselves set up with a team, get a really strong handle on their data, how they get that data, how they store that data, how they keep that data, and then they could potentially launch into running to first base. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point. I'm so glad you went back to that because we talk about this all the time on this podcast. First of all, getting the data is so important. You know, having access to the data is really, really critical, but the data is worthless if you don't do anything with it. I love the way you phrased it, having an intimate relationship with your data. I mean, this is really a powerful statement. And then it gets it gets so much crazier. Eventually, in, in the incremental approach, when you create these new systems, they're going to create new data. And you're constantly figuring out new ways to build upon the new data stream. You're concerning yourself with the data now at that point and how it plugs into your, your next process. So it's important to, as you build out your innovations, think about how they're connected to your broader vision and where they're going to get you and drive you towards your efficiency journey. And those data inputs need to be good. They need to be really accurate, nice, clean data, need to be stored properly, and then you need to be able to manipulate it down the road. It's a nebulous task that I think demographically my dad's generation really, really struggles with. The concept of your data is valuable. The millennials, the younger folks that have grown up with a screen in their hand, that have interacted with apps and data fields their entire life, they really do understand the concept better, or at least it's their first thought is, hey, let's Google it. My mindset's important if you're going to go down this journey. I think another point that you're making through this conversation is something that we talk about also all the time on this podcast, and that is this manufacturing skills gap and how do we get these young kids interested in manufacturing? So for someone like you, Mm -hmm. you grew up in manufacturing. So of course, that's a natural step for you. But these young kids who grow up, as you said, with the screen in their hand and already knowing everything there is to know about computers and programming and this sort of thing, there are very exciting jobs out there in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. For these people where they can practically play a video game all day, every day, if they want to, because there's a need for this. There's a huge need. There's a huge need. But, and this is where the American marketplaces, I think, failed for a long time. It's not sexy. We've done a poor job right. recruiting these, exactly. these these kids because it's but not- it is sexy. They just don't know it. We're terrible at marketing as an Our industry. Marketing I, is I, bad. Exactly. Yeah. yeah there's, there, it's very bad. There's a huge need for that. Tell My, kids, you can build the next space station or you, know, you yeah. can be on the next rocket with Branson. This is exciting. And it's all in manufacturing. These jobs yeah. are there. There's a couple people like in our- American landscape that I always come to mind when when I start down this conversation towards marketing and attracting talent and the skills gap. And one of them is Mike Rowe with Dirty Jobs. Have you ever oh, seen the Discovery Channel? Oh, for sure. Yeah, he's done us a huge favor by highlighting the fun that can be had, the innovation that can be had, just the excitement that's involved in some of these, what I think our educators for a long time have set aside as menial tasks or uh, non-glamorous right. or underpaid or not exciting. It's just the opposite. There's lots of crazy things we can do in our manufacturing space and the advent of Elon Musk. Musk and SpaceX, you know, is helping to highlight and reinvigorate the whole industry towards loftier goals. But between today and tomorrow, as an industry, we need to come up with a better marketing campaign to highlight our industry. And and the fun that can be had here. When you really drill into this conversation about the skills gap, it becomes a culture conversation. How do we create a culture, an environment where you don't get rid of the old guys? And in our company, we weren't very good about that initially. So when people didn't get on board, we just said, get off board. And that was our mistake. We did that a couple of times with some folks that I regret that were tenured employees, important in our organization, had a lot of historical perspective and experience level. I think that commonly occurs and it can't happen. We need to come up with a culture that keeps and maintains and retains those individuals, but you have to, and it takes time, you have to get them on board. Eventually, we turned that corner where we had some very tenured 30, 40 year employees that knew me from when I was in diapers, Uh (laughs) finally get on board with the program. They would say, okay, AJ, we believe these ideas you boys are coming up with have proven themselves lucrative. They're differentiators. They've made us wildly successful. And it took a lot, but they finally 100%, 100% believed and we kept them on board. That's important. You got to get the old guys to and old gals, the wise tenured folks who know a lot about the industry and have very valuable historical perspectives. You got to keep them. You got to retain them. You got to put them on board with this innovation journey and plug them into the program while also telling them that, hey, we're going to do some things that are 
weird, might make you uncomfortable, but you're just going to have to give us uh, some leeway to do that and give us a little bit of rope. And, and we might hang ourselves here and there, but ultimately we're all working towards the same vision, which is a brighter future for the company, for the industry. To my dad's credit, early on, he gave us a lot of rope and he wasn't very overly critical when we hung ourselves with it right. on occasion. That's good. Um, yeah, that's a really hard thing to do. Somebody who's been really successful and for 30, 40 years to, mm -hmm. to turn over the whole tenure uh, direction of your company and, and to explore new concepts and deploy new systems, it's, it's very difficult. But that's somehow we got to bring those two demographics together. There's, and, that there's this fine line, These the older guys, the older generation has all this tribal knowledge that's so important, but they also have something we rarely talk about and you kind of alluded to it and that is passion. They do I think this it. is sexy. They love going to work every day. They mm -hmm. think wastewater Water is sexy. <laughs> you know, they think yeah. that, you know, whatever they're doing is wonderful. And and then the younger guys coming up have these incredible automation skills and computer skills and internet skills and somehow transferring not only that tribal knowledge, but also that passion. And then they can in turn give some some of their tech knowledge, their tech savvy knowledge to mm -hmm. the older generation. There's got to be a molding of the minds somewhere in here. And I think that's what we've been trying to do for decades now. Maybe yeah. we're getting closer. I hope so. I, I think circumstances are forcing us to come together in this respect, <laughs> embrace some of the changes that have to happen that need to happen. I wish it would have organically happened a decade ago. I just think as an industry, we were preoccupied, didn't necessarily see the wing coming where it's going to, you know, the pendulum's kind of swinging back to the Made in America stance because of globalization's kind of wind down right. and supply chain issues abroad. It kind of caught us flat footed, but now we're adopting pretty quickly. Early in our story, and I've told this to people often because I'm trying to give credit to my dad's generation who did such a great job maintaining their passion and maintaining their course in a lot of these industries and working with what they had, which in a lot of cases was under investment. They needed more resources and weren't given those resources by the powers that be in many cases. And they still did a great job. In my dad's scenario, I walked into his office early in this process when we, we'd had several initial internal innovation wins. And so we had proven ourselves that we could do stuff that was new and fancy, and he didn't necessarily understand any of it, but he did see that we were doing more with, with less. So we were getting new business, but we weren't hiring people. So obviously we were more internally efficient and we weren't making mistakes. Well, I walked into his office and this is where in the Moneyball approach to innovation, I think there is a fundamental shift that happens when you round all the bases and you make it to home plate, home plate to me in the innovation journey is creating innovation, inventive systems or products that go external. So this is where you flip it. This is where you do a number of internal innovations that are inside your company's four walls. Once you have the experience level, the people, you've had multiple wins, now you're ready, you're mature, you can hit the home plate, you can hit that big vision, maybe accomplish that end goal. And ultimately, your organization is going to morph into an organization that is now prepared to invent systems, innovations that go external, that touch other businesses. And that's, and, that's and what we got. Are you talking about like shelf aware here? Is this? Yeah, so that's what eventually led us to a system that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that would impact another business in a positive way, create a win-win in the industry. Right. And that's really complex. Now you're talking about handling somebody else's data, putting systems on their premises, you know, systems that are integrated with the internet. Uh, they communicate outside their four walls. So there's tons of like security issues. There's data issues. There's lots of process issues where you're making two very different systems talk to each other in some cases. And it's really complex. But if you approach the money ball theory of incremental innovation, most of your wins early on, or all of them are probably going to be internal innovations. Eventually, as a company matures in this process, they've gotten to a perspective where they can launch external innovations. And that's where they can be game changing. You can really set yourself apart in the industry. You can really set yourself apart from your competitors when you invent a pump now that is so wildly efficient that can be connected with the internet and feed data back to consumers through a, an interface. That sort of external innovation is only really made possible by a series of internal innovation wins that I think leads to that maturity. It makes perfect sense. If it works for you, it could also work for other companies. And why not share? They're not your competitors. They're, there's so many industries that can benefit from some of this innovation. Why not put it out there and let other people accomplish what you've accomplished? Eventually, it turns into an ecosystem, or in our case, Shelf Wars turned into a, a platform, which 
allows for suppliers to collaborate with one another. And so it's a platform where multiple suppliers can hop on. We equip them as Shelfware to perform automated remote inventory management. And collectively, these suppliers then can accommodate the largest consumers that purchase product from a variety of product verticals as inputs into their manufacturing process. And so that type of external, though, it takes time. I think you can move really fast with it, but I think it's going to take an organization a couple years minimum and a whole bunch of internal innovation wins before they should probably start swinging for the external innovation fences. Makes perfect money ball sense. Tell me a little bit about tech stack. So Moneyball, I backed into that. So that wasn't anything I invented the term. The tech stack term is more, I think, my own moniker. I think I created that one. Uh Maybe I didn't. It might exist in the ecosystem and business in general. But for us, for our family business, it's where you take the Moneyball theories of innovation and you start to morph it into the practical. Okay, oh, Andrew, this all sounds really good. We got our team. We got a handle on our data. We got a programmer that can do software that can help us write some internal uh, automation software and programs. But physically, how do we put this all together? In a practical sense, what are we going to do tomorrow tomorrow? What are we going to interact with? And the tech stack is the idea that right now, today, in the ecosystem in the United States, there are a ton of devices that are internet capable, that are capable of being networked together. I'm talking about handheld devices like your mobile phone, writing mobile applications that live in the cloud environment, scanners, printers, peripherals, sensors like RFID tags, sensors like GPS coordinate tags that will help you track your work in process. There's all sorts of devices manufactured by third parties that are designed from the get-go to be agnostic, meaning they will work in the cloud environment and play well, play nice with others. Mm -hmm. That's the tech stack environment. You can take three or four bits and pieces off of the shelf out of a catalog and put them together with a little bit of custom software to create systems that are wildly scalable, customizable, wildly efficient, and can touch other businesses. Shelfware is a great example of the tech stack. We deploy off-the-shelf hardware that's produced and has been produced for a long time by Zebra. So this is not like cutting edge Zebra technology. This is Zebra RFID tech that's been out for years. That's well proven. We take off the shelf Zebra stuff. We take off the shelf workbenches from Sam's Club or Costco and outfit them with RFID hardware. We take off the shelf LED lights that are designed to interface with a GPIO port. We take an off the shelf mobile phone, Android or Apple, and we write a mobile app for it to drive an RFID handheld reader. So it's all this stuff that we're not inventing all of these pieces. We are inventing a system, but we're using off-the-shelf pieces to do it. Uh, off-the-shelf pieces of software sometimes. Off-the-shelf pieces of hardware, of course. So that that's this tech stack approach where I would not go to a giant company and buy some system out of the box. In my approach, or what we've had a lot of success with, is building it with pre-existing pieces and components. And then and sometimes you have to glue it together with a little bit of software, sometimes called middleware. So that's the tech stack approach. I think it's wildly advantageous. It's going to render a, a better product for your company. And it does take some time. It does take some strategies like Moneyball, but eventually that's much more lucrative. It takes a little bit of creativity too. It's really fascinating. Yep. You have to have a bit right. of a visionary. And that's, if you're going to assemble a team of innovators, you want to pick folks with those talents and characteristics involved. So you'll have the visionary, the dreamer, who is wildly optimistic and full of crap. That'd be me. (laughs) And then you have the executor guy. Again, the baseball analogy is perfect, but you're going to have people that have specialized skill sets, the visionary, the creative person like you were talking about, uh, who can dream it. Might not even have any legs to it. Like they don't necessarily know how we're going to execute it, but they're dreaming about it. And then you'll have the guy that actually executes it, the gal that's really familiar with the company and knows all your data. It just takes a whole team to execute this theory. I guess you kind of need a MacGyver type guy who can put all the pieces together, the pieces of the puzzle together. Like you said, going to Costco Mm -hmm. to get the shelf or whatever. MacGyver type builder who says, we can make it this way or that way. Mm -hmm. bringing in all the elements. The problem is we got to interest the whole marketplace to adopt this approach and adopt it quickly because time is of the essence. We need to continue to set ourselves apart in the global marketplace. That's right. And that's a good segue. We've talked a little bit about where you've been and what you've seen. And we've talked a little bit about where we are now. So let's talk about the future. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, what does the factory of the future look like to you? So the factory of the future, from my perspective... I'll talk about two things. First off, the trend I'm seeing in the factories right now, what people 
tend to be asking me a lot about, there's a high demand for it, and that is work in process tracking. I believe that in the near future, manufacturers are going to deploy a whole host of different systems that do a much better job of showing production managers and folks in the scheduling room and department about exactly where all materials are at in the process in the factory. Like real-time visibility, physical tracking of assets and that'll be on a you know giant TV screen, and you'll actually see little carts moving around in real time. So those systems are in high demand and will be deployed in vast numbers in the near future. And it's going to be an integral part to us uh, making a more efficient manufacturing environment is knowing exactly where all the pieces of the puzzle are at any given time. I see that trend coming. But in the future, it's going to be an ecosystem of connected devices and connected people that's run centrally. And it won't be a factory connected, it'll be a factory connected with its supply chain, both forwards and backwards. I think the inbound supply chain to factories is going to be completely digitized. That's what Shelfware is working on. And I think the outbound supply chain, finished goods, that they're going to manufacture finished goods like pumps and motors, ship them to distributors and have real-time visibility of the product that's moving off the shelf so they can act on near-term trends and spool production based on near-term consumption in their in their distribution channels. So visibility, collaboration, interconnectivity of systems, it's all coming and it's all going to be made possible by the cloud environment that we have created in the last decade. And you're seeing a lot of this in the consumer world and it's just going to bleed over to the manufacturing world really, really fast. Very interesting perspective. That was great. Thank you for being here. I really enjoyed this conversation. I knew I would, but it's even been more exciting and informative than I thought. So thank you for that. Oh, no. My pleasure entirely. Thank you for the platform to talk about this. It's, it's my passion. We could do 20 episodes. I'll never quit talking about this stuff. Well, I, we'll I have you it. back for sure, because I know there's more that we could talk about. Definitely bring you back again. But for now, I want to give you a chance to kind of wrap it up and give us your final thoughts and just tell us anything that I wasn't smart enough to ask you about that maybe you think the listeners would enjoy knowing. Well, I, I always say the same thing, like no matter who I'm talking to, obviously I'm an organic approach guy. So I like to get my hands dirty and I, I grew up in the small business environment and aspirations to be a big business. And so my encouragement has been the same for years now is get your hands messy, get dirty. Managers need to get out on the factory floor and recognize the real problems and bottlenecks and they need to come up with solutions. And those solutions are not far away and it's not a big check you need to write. There's not a ton of money you need to spend. You just need to get your hands dirty, put a team together who can execute quickly on these ideas, solve these problems, come up with real solutions. And it's not that hard. <laughs> so just get out there and do it. Well, you have to be brave enough, I think, to take those ideas and make them happen. We're crazy enough. I mean, bravery, <laughs> crazy, whatever you want to say, you just got to get out there. It takes a little bit of up. crazy, a little bit of brave, and and also just a little bit of support from those around you. And going back to the money ball scenario, it's a team effort. Put the right team around you and look for the small wins. It's, it's a really interesting concept. Yeah. Yep. And you cool. don't have to be geniuses. None of us were. Just get out there and do it. You just got to do it. <laughs> Very fun. Very good. Thank you so much, Andrew. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I really loved it. This brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening. Please do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on iTunes. If you have interesting information to share and want to contact me about being a guest on a future episode of this podcast, please send me an email at michelle at navigatecontent.com. You can also send me questions that I will have my expert guests answer for you on a future episode. And in the meantime, please check out my book series on modern manufacturing to read more than 30 real world case studies about how global companies are using smart technology and innovation to build the factory of the future. All the links to the books and articles mentioned in this podcast are in the show notes. Have a great week and please join me for the next episode of Factory of the Future. Mm -hmm.